In this video, we are going to look at the single cycle data path for the RISC-5 32 architecture. Let's first understand the flow of an instruction as it proceeds through the processor. First, we get an instruction address that is presented at the clock edge. In fact, we assume that the instruction address comes out of the program counter at the clock edge, so there is some kind of a small delay, a TCQ perhaps, associated with the appearance of the instruction address at the IMM. The IMM responds in a combinational fashion. That is to say, it takes the address and without waiting for another clock cycle, it gives us the instruction. This instruction then needs to get decoded. Several signals need to be sent to the registers, the ALU, the memory, the branch condition check and so on. And then thereafter, we need to execute on the actual operation that is required. This could be either an ALU type operation or a memory access operation or a branch. Finally, we may need to update one of the registers or we may need to update memory. After all this is done, we need to set up the address corresponding to the next instruction and then we can wait for the next clock edge which tells us to repeat the entire process again. What we are going to do now is to look at the hardware as we have it up to this point in time and see how it allows us to implement all of this in a single clock cycle and try and understand what are the limitations imposed by that and whether this actually is a good architecture or not. One of the first things that need to be done is that the ALU control signals need to be generated. In the case of a load operation, the ALU is still used. For what purpose? The ALU in this case generates the address corresponding to the load or store operation. In the case of a branch instruction, similarly, the condition check, the branch if equal, for example, would be implemented using a subtract operation, which ideally is also done using the ALU. Since we know that during the time that a branch equals instruction is executing, we are not going to be using the ALU for anything else. So it makes sense to sort of see if we can reuse the ALU for the same purpose. All the other kinds of regular ALU operations, of course, the typical R type or register type instructions, add, subtract, and, or, etc., all of them, of course, require the ALU by definition. Now for each of these, we need some kind of ALU control signals, which tell the ALU what kind of operation it needs to perform. You have probably already come up with some kind of an encoding for this. What is displayed over here is one possible encoding and not necessarily the only possible one. Ideally, you would want to make sure that the add instructions, which are used for load and store to compute the address, have the same opcode as the add instruction actually required by the ALU. But apart from that, there is really nothing else that needs to be kept common. And even that is just an optimization from the point of view of the hardware. Given all of this, what does our final architecture look like? The blocks that we have to deal with are quite a few by this point in time. We can see that the ALU is of course the core of our processor, the one that actually does the computations, so to say. The next most important part was the register file, which gave us inputs for the ALU and also took the outputs of the ALU and stored them back. Of, apart from that, we might want to either load data from memory or store data back into memory. And of course, we also have an instruction memory that takes care of actually telling us what to do. And finally, as we saw in the case of branch instructions, the program counter can be manipulated to either read successive instructions or jump to an entirely new portion of the memory and start fetching instructions from there. Everything else apart from these blocks are either muxes or small portions of logic that essentially allow us to control what is finally going to happen in terms of the next instruction as well as executing the current instruction. As we can see from the previous diagram, there are a few signals that we need to keep in mind. For example, reg write. What would we use the reg write signal for? Essentially, it's used to control whether or not we need to update the value 
in the register file. Now in this particular context, D asserted usually means takes the value zero and asserted typically means takes the value one. The reason why we use the terms D asserted and asserted is because you could easily also change the interpretation. You might decide that asserted is actually corresponding to the value zero, maybe because it makes it easier for you to implement some particular type of logic. In general, for now we will assume that D asserted means the signal has the value zero and asserted means it has the value one. But keep in mind that these terms do not actually mean the value zero and one. What they do mean is how is this value interpreted by the corresponding logic. In the case of reg write, for example, when it is D asserted, it does not have any effect. What that means is no registers change their value. On the other hand, when it is asserted, the RD, the five bit value that is fed into the register file is used as a target address and the value that is there at the right data input of the register file is actually written into the corresponding register. In other words, for any ALU operation or for a load operation, the reg write signal would be equal to one or would be asserted. Whereas for let's say a store operation or a branch operation where we are not doing a jump and link, for example, the reg write should be de asserted. Now, what about the ALU source? In this case, it is used in order to allow us to work with immediate operands. After all, as far as the ALU is concerned, it just gets its input from somewhere outside. So far, we were assuming that that input comes from the register file, but as we have seen, it could also have come from an immediate operand. The ALU source control signal allows us to choose between the two. The PC source essentially controls branching operations. If the PC source signal is deasserted, we go by the regular sequential logic. That is to say, PC is replaced by PC plus four. However, if PC source is asserted, it is replaced by the output of the adder that computes the branch target. This gives us total flexibility in terms of how branches are implemented because we simply have an adder that needs to compute the branch target how would it do this in the case of, let's say, a branch operation? One of the inputs to the adder would be the current value of the program counter. The other input would be the immediate value stored in the instruction. Similarly, for the jump instructions and so on. The PC source operation allows us to execute both unconditional and conditional branches. For unconditional branches, PC source would always be asserted. For conditional branches, PC source would be asserted only if it is a branch instruction and if the condition is satisfied. For other kinds of instructions, of course, load, store, and ALU, PC source would be deasserted. What about mem read? When it is deasserted, the data memory is essentially out of the picture. We neither read nor write from it. Similarly, mem write. On the other hand, when mem read is high, the address that is computed using the ALU is fed to the data memory, a read signal is given to the data memory, and the value coming back from the data memory is now ready for use. It is basically put onto the read data output, and most likely, assuming that this was a load operation, will then make its way into the register file. What about mem write? This is for a store operation where we would be taking a value from the register and putting it into the data memory and enabling the mem write signal so that we need to write a value into it. And finally, there's one more signal, mem to reg, which basically decides whether the input going into the register file is coming from the ALU or from the data memory. In principle, the mem read and the mem to reg signal are very similar and when you actually implement it, you might find that you might be able to do some optimizations of the logic over there. But purely from the point of view of understanding, it makes sense to think of these as two separate and distinct signals. All of these signals are things that you would need to implement in order to get your architecture working.
So let's now walk through examples of the three basic types of instructions. The first would be the R type instruction. What would be the flow of execution that happens in an R type instruction? We would start of course with the output of the program counter happening immediately after the clock edge. That would then make its way through the instruction memory, come out as an instruction, which in turn would then propagate through the register file and take out two values from the register file and feed them into the ALU. The ALU in turn would perform its computation. Its output would go through this MUX and return all the way back to the register file where it would get written at the next clock edge. What about a load instruction? Once again, our flow starts from the program counter. It goes through the instruction memory. Now in this case, it's a load operation. What do we need to do for a load operation? We need to compute the address from which to load, which means that we need to access a register, take that value through the ALU in order to compute the address. And that address is then fed to the data memory. The data memory generates output, which goes through the read data. It goes through the MUX, once again makes its way back into the register file. As you can see in this case, not only the ALU output, but also the path through the data memory is involved before we get back to the register file. What about a branch operation? In the case of the branch operation, once again, we start from the program counter, we go through the instruction memory. Assuming that we are doing some kind of a comparison, we would then read the values from the register file, go through the ALU, where the zero signal would essentially indicate whether or not the branch needs to be taken. At the same time, there is also some logic out here, which basically tells us whether or not we need to actually perform a branch. And similarly, there is also something else that takes care of computing the address required for the branch. These then get together the branch instruction combined with the AND operation basically selects the MUX and we go all the way back to the program counter. As you could see from the examples before, in each of the cases, we essentially start from the program counter at a clock edge, pass through the instruction memory, go through some kind of instruction decoding, which could either go through the register file or might also have a path which goes through the immediate generation and the ALU control. But typically the longest path, one possible path which definitely seems long is one which goes through the ALU, computes an address, then goes through the data memory in order to fetch data out, goes through the multiplexer and finally makes its way all the way back into the register file. We started at a clock edge. This would correspond to one clock edge. When we read out the value from the program counter and we would terminate at another clock edge where we actually write the data back into the register. The time between these is all spent doing combinational logic, as you can see, at least in the way that we have described it so far which means that we could potentially have a long combinational path which goes all the way from the program counter through the instruction memory, the register file, the ALU, the data memory, the MUX, and comes back to the setup time before being written into the register. In general, this could turn out to be a fairly long combinational path. The problem with this approach, or rather the problems with this approach are many. One of them is the assumption that an instruction memory and data memory can both respond in a combinational manner. Implementing large blocks of memory in a combinational manner is generally hard to do. Similarly, the register file of course has to be implemented combinationally. The assumption is that the register file is small enough that it can be done without too much difficulty. But another problem that arises is the ALU itself. For certain simple kinds of operations like AND operations, additions and so on, it probably makes sense to consider that the ALU has more or less the same delay through all the different kinds of operations. However, if we start adding operations like multiplications or 64-bit multiplications or other kinds of operations that have longer critical paths, 
we would find that the entire system that we have designed so far still needs to finish within one clock cycle. And this starts to become an issue because the difference between the shortest path that could be executed through this entire logic versus the longest path becomes such that we would probably end up wasting a lot of time since we always have to design for the worst case scenario. In other words, we have to design for the longest path through the circuit. And even if the majority of the operations could execute in a fraction of that time, the clock cycle would be determined by the worst case delay through this entire chain. As a result of this, this single cycle implementation is not very common. And although we will take this as the first implementation that we need to do from the Verilog code, we will then find that we need to look for optimizations or better ways of implementing this chain such that we can improve the performance and balance out in such a way that we do not waste as many clock cycles as would happen from this straightforward implementation.